he went from parking cars to owning the largest parking company in the United States. And I asked him, like, how did you do that? Now, instead of renting a Ferrari for 3000 a day, they're renting it for $1,000 a day. But how can I compete with that? It's impossible. Choosing to believe that we are abundant and that when we give, and we give with love, and we give with no expectation, the universe will give us back tenfold. So we became the number one client of vintage Lamborghini parts in the world. So Lamborghini called us. Welcome to the Path to Purpose podcast, where I share incredible conversations with amazing humans who went through a pivotal shift in their lives that have put them on their path of purpose, profit, and impact. My name is Zarek Fata. I am a serial entrepreneur and life coach. I went through my own transformational journey where I'm now committed to living a life of inspiration, education, and empowerment. My intention is to share these conversations so they inspire you to also walk your path to purpose. All right, so today we're coming to you from Miami Beach and we are filming at the beautiful Sabia Wellness Retreat Center. And I'm excited to sit down and have a conversation with my buddy, Jordi Ricard. He is the co-founder of Curated, the largest vintage Lamborghini dealership in the world. And if you know anything about me, I love cars. I'm a big car guy. I've done gumball twice. And when Jordy reached out to me and we connected on Instagram, I was like, yeah, we got to talk. And I had no idea that this man has such a fascinating backstory. I was just in love with the cars. I want to hang out with him so I can go roll around in some Lambos. But we had a chance to get together and have a really beautiful deep dive conversation about his story, his come up as an entrepreneur. And I just knew that I had to have you on the Path Podcast to share your journey because it is truly inspiring for any of those out there who have hit your rock bottom and you're wondering, what can you do next? Where do I go from here? When you think you have really no options left, this story is going to show you that. Give it one more shot and you'll be amazed at what can happen if you try just one more time. So Jordy, thank you for joining me here on the Path Podcast. I appreciate your time and look forward to diving in with you, my friend. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Yes, so this is actually also Jordy's first podcast. So, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure there will be many, many more to come because when your book gets published and more, more people know about who you are and your story, everybody's gonna want you to come out and speak and share. So. You know, for the re for the listeners, for the viewers um, who don't know who you are, you know, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your backstory before you became the co-founder of Curated. You know, where where were you ten years ago before your big move to Miami? So twelve years ago. Okay. So I moved to Miami in December two thousand and twelve. Uh, before moving to Miami, okay, I, I'm gonna start when when I was a kid, no. So when I was a kid, uh, due to my my dad's job, I uh, I moved a lot around okay so i remember being a kid i remember like changing schools like seven or eight times you know and i always remember that first day at school you know so i was a shy guy you know i was the, the, the i didn't know anybody so that's what that's one of the things that marked me from my youth and then you know like uh we ended up moving back to barcelona i ended up studying there uh, i studied two degrees i studied law and I studied business as well and, uh, you know, my dad was a banker. I always wanted to be like him, you know? I wanted to be like, uh, like that. he used to see my dad as a boss, you know? So he was tough as well. Uh, and I'm like, hey, like, this is what, this is what business is. So, um, you know, like I finished my studies. I had the opportunity to work uh, the last two years of, uh, of my university. And I had the opportunity to work for a jewelry company. It was actually the, one of the largest jewelry companies in, in Europe. They had the factory in, in India with 600 employees. And, um, and I, I was the assistant to the general manager for two years. Once I finished my studies, I became the operations manager. So I was like 24, 25 years old. I was uh, supervising a lot of people for, for, for my age and I, my experience. And over there, like I, I learned a lot, but I also learned what I, I learned what I didn't want to have in my company the day that I had my own company. Uh, I had a boss, okay, he was, uh, he was tough. He was super tough on me. He was tough on my employees. You know, he made me cry many times. He used to make cry all my employees. Every day there was somebody crying. And we even had a room called the colonoscopy room. That it was like when your boss and the boss was, Jordi, come here. You know, it's like everybody's like, whoa, colonoscopy. So, you know, we even had that room. So imagine the 
how toxic the environment was over there. I learned a lot on operations, you know, and, and doing business internationally with India. But uh, man, like from a per personal point of view, it was tough. That was tough. On the other side, while I was studying in university and then working, I was involved in politics as well. Okay, I thought that I could change the world, you know, like by being involved in politics. And then I realized that uh, there's nothing the politicians can do. You know, like it's, uh, you know, like my friends, the, the ones that are, uh, the, the, the people that they were studying, that they were working, you know, in, they, they had good jobs, you know, like they didn't, they, they were not involved, you know, they were not as involved and they didn't have the opportunities that the people that didn't have jobs, you know, like they were all day there in the political party. So they were scaling within. So at the end of the day, the guys that were taking the lead, you know, they, they, they were the guys that they, they were not ready, you know, to do that. So then is when I decided to focus full time uh, my efforts in in business and try to grow there. So um, so after that, uh, you know, after being like for four years in the jewelry company, I decided that I couldn't be there anymore. You know, like that guy was like was putting me down. You know, I was like bad. I was struggling personally, professionally. So I decided to leave the company, find a, a job in sales. You know, I always told to myself, like, from when I finish my studies to, till I'm 30, I don't, I don't care about money. I just want to learn, learn, learn. So I spent four years in operations in that company. And then I'm like, now I need to get some experience in sales. So I left the company. I went to another company. It was in the, in the textile industry. We were buying yarn in Asia and selling it in Europe. So I did that for another, like, three years. And, and then I had a friend of mine. Okay, yeah, my best friend actually, he invested in a company in Miami. They started a car club. It was a membership program. You used to, let's say, pay $30,000 for a membership, and then you can get access to cars, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and, uh, and these things. So he started this company here with, uh, with a, another friend from Spain, and they started this business. And I, I used to tell him, like, how are you doing? And he's like, oh, great, great, I'm doing great. So then you know, one day he calls me, uh, it was uh, like 12 at night in, in Barcelona, it was 6 a.m. here and, and he's like, Jordi, like I need to talk to you. Like I, I've been telling you for a year that we were doing amazing, this is a disaster. We started with 12 cars, we have six cars, I don't know what to do, uh, I'm lost, my dad is gonna kill me when he finds out, could you move to Miami, could you come to Miami for a couple of weeks to help me? So, so then is when I decided to, to come to Miami for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Now he called on you, not because you're a car guy, but more so for your financial background and your business education training. Exactly. He was, uh, because of that. So he needed some help. So, uh, and you had never been in Miami before? Never. Okay. No. I, I'm lying. I was in Miami in 2006. So since I was involved in politics, I was the... I don't remember how we call it, but like the international office or something like that. So I used to, to travel a little bit, okay? Uh, we were part of the International Liberal Youth and the, interna uh, and the, the LIMEC, like the, the European uh, Liberal uh, in, in Europe. Right? So, so in 2006, there was the Young Democrats of America convention. So I, came, I went to Dallas and then we stopped in Miami for like a couple of days partying. Got it. Okay. So you're in Spain. Your friend calls you up. Hey, I really need your help. You know, uh, can you come for a few weeks? Now, at that moment, you had a choice to make, and you thought you were just coming for a few weeks. Obviously, yeah. it turned out to be much longer than that. What was going on in your head at that time where you're thinking, you're just going to go for a few weeks, you're going to go help your friend out, and you know, you're going to get involved in the business that you actually don't really know anything about? So I always wanted to leave space. Hey, no, like at least like, so I studied in, in London for I did the summer school in London, you know, like I, I did like two, three months, you know, I, I was in Malta as well, studying some English and I, I, I enjoyed so much. So I always wanted to do something like this, but I had my girlfriend, you know, and it was like, she was not the type of person that wanted to leave. At some point I was engaged with this woman. I was 25, you know, I ended up finding out that she cheated on me. So it was a disaster as you can imagine, disaster. So it was, she did you a favor. I agree 100% today, 100%. But you know, like, it was like, it was a tough times for me as well in Europe. So I had that job, that boss, you know, this thing happens, you know, personally. So I was like, it was bad, you know, it was, I was, I was lost. So then this, the friend of mine calls me, he's like, hey, uh, why don't you help me? So I was like, hey, let's go. So I came here for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I 
soon saw the situation, it was bad. So we sent the guy that was managing the company here, we sent him back to Spain. And the goal for me was like to liquidate the company at the end of the day. So I started meeting with all the dealerships in Miami, finding out how much they would give me for the cars. And then, you know, like, but I saw an opportunity. I'm like, hey, maybe we could do something with this thing. So I started meeting with all the the comp- uh, people that were renting cars. I, we didn't have clients, but I'm like, hey, I offer them. Like, we had six cars. I'm like, yeah, hey, I have these cars here. Like, why don't you use them? You know, I'll give you a wholesale rate. So in a, in, a, in a week, you know, everybody starts calling me. So we start renting cars. Wow. So we're making some money. Then I start meeting with um, with some of the clients of the potential members that they had met with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I realized that these guys, they were not closing because they didn't like this guy, you know, the, the guy from Spain. He was a little arrogant, mm. you know. And uh, then they met me. We closed one membership. We closed another membership. We start closing some memberships. I'm like, wow. So, so, it, so it, when my friend came to Miami with his general manager, I told, I told them, like, guys, there's two options here. One is that we liquidate the company, okay, and you're going to take back, like, probably 50% of your investment. And two, maybe you, can, you continue this. So, um, so I gave them the two options. I remember like my friend's general manager, next day it was 5 a.m., he couldn't sleep, and he woke me up, he's like, let's go for a walk. And he told me like, hey, would you stay? And uh, I was like, I'd rather invest another $100,000 and try it than just like shutting it down and I'm losing 50%. So I remember at the time I was shocked because like it was February, it was Miami, imagine I had been here for like two, three weeks sunny mm-hmm. i was single so you see all these you know like beautiful women everywhere you were highly motivated I, exactly high. you know so i'm like wow this, this is crazy so i'm like why not why you not? know maybe like if it doesn't work i'll go back to spain right so let's try so i decided to stay and what i was telling you you know i started meeting with all these potential members they start closing 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 so we close like five six memberships you know we're talking like 25 to thirty thousand dollars a membership mm-hmm. We start like wholesaling these cars, you know, like the rental and, and the companies are like starting to take off. Mm-hmm. Now, how many cars do you have at this time? Uh, at that time, we had like six cars. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of cars were they? It was a Ferrari 458, a Lamborghini Gallardo. It was a Maserati. Um, what else? Uh, we had a Range Rover. Okay. There was something else. Okay. And what, what year was this? That was 2000, 2013. Okay. So uh, probably one of the first luxury car rental companies because in 2013 I, I i don't remember there being a lot i mean maybe i'm wrong but yeah. what what did you have much competition at the time so there was some competition there were like some like smaller companies but uh, everything was like you know i was meeting with the owners of all these companies and like nobody was like a business person okay you know like uh so so i saw that and i'm like wow but there was a company in miami that they were doing amazing it was called lulavi so i used to look up to them like wow look at these guys Crazy marketing, amazing marketing. So when I started selling memberships, and one day, boom, I met somebody, one of the partners at Lula V, and I tell them, like, I have this cartel concept. They're like, wow, we love this. Mm. Like, we would love to buy you. So I call my friend, like, listen, there's an opportunity to sell. If you want, if you guys, his dad was putting a lot of pressure on my friend. Mm-hmm. He didn't like the business. So as soon as his dad found out, he's like, sell this thing. So I'm like, okay, guys, like, I think that there's an opportunity here, but if you guys want to sell, whatever, let's sell it. So I thought that I was going to sell it and I was going to go back to Spain. So I sold the company to this group, Lula B, and then they asked me, like, no, 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 you're staying with us. You know, like, this is the, you're managing the club, so we want you to manage the club for us. So that in, there is where I met my current business partner, John Tamarian. John right. Tamarian was the founder of Lula B. He had uh, some investors. Uh, so, so then is when I met him. So... I met him the day that we were signing the transaction. Okay. So I, I was I did everything with his business partner. So imagine John didn't like me at the time. Okay. You know, like <laughs> there was a big crash of egos. Like imagine John was like he was you know he had a big ego. He was like this like cool guy you know like from Miami, and I now I was like this guy that was speaking broken English and didn't know a lot. So um, so yeah, and uh, so this is how everything started in August two thousand thirteen uh, is when we merged. Both companies. Okay, nice. And with this clash of egos, you know, you coming with your skill set, John being, you know, the co-founder, wanting to do things his way. How are you guys able to emesh and, I guess, develop a synchronistic partnership? Because I know what that's like when you're kind of forced into a partnership with someone who maybe you, you don't align with. Yeah. And of course, you know, a partnership is like a marriage. So it's almost like a, um, 
what do they call it? Um, an arranged marriage where you and John are now together and now you have to raise this child, this company together. So what was that like, the two of you? Because you both, from what I know, have very different personalities too. We're super different. You know? like, <laughs> they're like, look, this is the way I dress. Yeah, I've seen John, I see his style. He's like, he looks very LA, very, exactly. yeah, so very different personality types. But that's what works, right? The yin yeah. yang. I remember that my partner, Ralph and I, we've been partners for over 20 years and people would say, I don't know how you two work together because you're just so absolutely different polar opposites, but that's what makes it work. So tell me about your partnership with John and how you're able to make it work. At the beginning, it was difficult. It was tough. You know, I was trying so hard, but uh, he, I don't know, like, I don't know what he had in his mind, you know, but uh, it was difficult. But then, you know, like the company was, we had like 25 cars. We had everything. It was massive. But I, I always saw like John giving out checks and checks and checks. I'm like, shit, like the, I didn't know, I didn't know the financials, but I could tell that mm -hmm. the, that company was losing money for sure. Mm -hmm. Like we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on everything, SEO, Google ads. And I'm like, I, I could see all the leads that were coming in and it was not that much. So one day I sat him down and I'm like, Hey John, I need to talk to you. So I sat him down and I told him like, I got a big piece of paper. I'm like, write down everything that you do. And he starts writing, okay, like uh, accounting, marketing, this, that. And he wrote down like 18, 19 things, mm -hmm. huge list. I'm like, okay, now tell me what you like to do. And he says like marketing, uh, BAP clients, you know, it was like four things. Mm -hmm. I'm like, exactly. Like, why don't you allow me to do the rest? Because at that time I was just managing the membership program. So I was doing more sales right. membership programs. Like, let me manage the company. You focus on your things and let me do the rest. So How did he receive that? I think that. You know, like he had a lot on his shoulders and he saw that as an opportunity to like, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, so it was, yeah, I don't know how I had the balls to say, to tell him that at the yeah. time, you know, because, I, and then, and then he took it like, oh, let's do it. So at the beginning it was like, you, you, there was like some friction. Sure. Okay. But we started working together. What happened? And I think that this is what helped us. It was a disaster, but I think that it helped us. It was that, uh, you know. 60, 70% of our business was coming from Brazil. It was crazy. Like everything was from Brazil. So in 2014, 15, like Brazil got into a huge crisis. Mm. So overnight, like in a period of, I would say like a couple of months, we lost 70% of our business. Wow. So we went from like, because like that year, you know, when I, when I, when I started with John, when I took over like the management of the company, okay, I found out the company was losing like $800,000. So I started like pushing, like, Crazy, like my old boss used to do. You're right. Okay, like th that's when I knew I started pushing the employees. I started pushing like everything, like and even John. Sometimes he was afraid of me. You know, he's like, "Bro, you cannot do this. You shouldn't do this." I'm like, "I know," but I so that next year, okay, we made eighty k. We made eighty thousand dollars. So in the short you went from so negative eight hundred one year to positive eighty eighty thousand. So yes. almost a nine hundred thousand yes. dollar. Yes, but I would. Yeah pushing like, a, like an animal, but I, so you can imagine, okay, like my employees were not happy, John was not happy, I was not happy, nobody was happy. But that's what I knew and that's what, what I thought that I had to do to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So so imagine, we're making 80K, we're excited, we're, we're like, oh, let's open New York. So we send Anna, one of our, uh, you know, like she's like our sister, we send Anna to New York to open New York, we start opening New York, and then it's when Brazil disappears and boom, you know, we lose all our business. So from nothing, to making some money, to losing everything again. Anna comes back, we shut down in New York. I was like, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. So, you know, John and I, we struggled so much together, you know, that uh, I think that that started like making a, like a, a big bond, you know, like we were like crying together, you know, at night we were texting each other, we were calling each other, we, like we didn't have anybody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we went through that period that uh, it was so crazy that I think that that's what got us together at the end of the day. You know, we were supporting each other. And in this period of time, okay, it's when, uh, you know, like John, he knows about cars. Like he's, that's his passion. His grandfather was a mechanic. His father was a mechanic. Mm -hmm. You know, he grew up around these cars. So in this, in this period of time, when, uh, when we didn't have anything, you know, like at some point we decided like we had to pay rent. We had to pay the employees. We had to pay insurance. So at the end of the day, like if we had to pay all these things, there was not more money. So John and I, we decided not to take a salary, you know, and for five, six months, we didn't take a salary. So in this period of time, you know, John ended up like funding his watch just to pay rent, 
you know, I had at some point like $150 in my bank account. It was a disaster. But in the spirit of time as well, you know, it's when this crazy opportunity show up. So I see John buying an old Ferrari for like twenty or $30,000 on lease, you know, putting 10% down. And I thought that he was crazy. I'm like, brother, are you insane? We don't know, like, if we're going to take a salary next month. And now you're buying an old Ferrari. You know, what was it? What the lease? value of the Ferrari? So that's the thing I didn't know. Okay. Because for me, it was like for me, a car was an a depreciating asset. You okay. know, my my cars in the big in the the brand new cars were depreciating twenty to thirty percent a year. Mm-hmm. So he's like, no, no, I I got it, I got it. You will see, I'll sell it for a lot of money. So he paid like twenty or thirty thousand, and in like a month or two, he sells that car and he makes twenty thousand dollar profit. So I was shocked. And when you have nothing, twenty thousand dollars, it was a fortune. So I'm like, wow. So then is when I told him, like, why don't we do this as a business? Mm-hmm. Like, can we do it? And he's like, yeah, but uh, do you have money? Because I don't have any money. So, um, so I told him, I don't have any money, but I have friends that I can call. And then is when I called my friend Gerard again. I'm like, hey, Gerard, you know, like, you brought me to Miami, sold the company. I have, you know, like, why don't we buy a... And, and John told me, like, I have a, this Lamborghini Countach that I can buy for, like, probably 200000 And maybe I can sell it for, like, 280000 to 90. So Gerard, I told Gerard, like, hey, send me two hundred k I, tr- I trust John. I believe in John. He just bought this car for like twenty or thirty thousand, and he made twenty thousand in profit. So Gerard sends me the money. It was a seventy thirty split, seventy for him. And man, John sold that car, and we made ninety thousand dollars to Gerard in like a couple of months. Wow. So when I called Gerard, and he's like, "You know what? Like, don't send me the money back. Just keep the principal and the and the profits, and keep doing it." Amazing. So in two thousand and fourteen, we did like nine deals where Gerard was making seventy percent. We were making thirty percent. Sweet deal for him. Exactly. No, yeah. amazing. Yeah. But uh, but you know what? Like, he brought me here as well, you know? So uh, that was a, another way to, you know, like, he gave me an opportunity, and this is how life works, and we're going to talk about this later, but, you know, like, he gave me an opportunity. He lost money in, in his deal, you know, at the end of the day, he didn't get all his money back, but now he was starting to get some money back, you know? Right. So when yeah. you give an opportunity, when you help people, you know, like, then it comes back. So, and you will see, as we talk, like Gerard got all his money back for a lot of profit, but he created an opportunity for me. Right. So, and that's how, you know, we started doing these little deals uh, where John was making 15%, I was making my 15%. We were not taking a salary from Lula for the car rental agency, but we were surviving with this 5,000 here, 2,000 there. So at this point, you're still renting the cars. You're also now buying and flipping cars and the dealership or the rental business is still going. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's still going. It's going like it's a disaster. Okay. So Brazil disappears. You know, like everybody starts shutting down. All my competitors in Miami they shut down. We're like we were a stronger company in Miami, and then they come back. But this time they don't own their cars. They don't have insurance on the cars. Like, is let's say that you you have good credit, so you buy a Ferrari, and I tell you like, hey, let me rent your Ferrari for like ten days a month. And, you know, like you're going to own it for free. You're going to make money. So they start using other people's cars and they're putting it in the market. But now instead of renting a Ferrari for 3000 a day, they're renting it for $1,000 a day. So how can I compete with that? It's impossible. Mm. So we kept going down and down and down. It was bad. But in, the, in that time, okay, in, in 2014 for our Basel, we put together a crazy, crazy party, like an, an, an event. At the, we used to have like a beautiful showroom. It was an art gallery with the cars. So we put together an event. It was Lula V and Pinion Farina presenting Mr. Brainwash. And mm-hmm. Mr. Brainwash painted live a uh, Maserati that we had. Yeah. So it was crazy. We had more than a thousand people in the showroom that day. And the following day, this guy, shorts, flip flops, come in the showroom. There was paint everywhere. Mm-hmm. And this guy comes in, you know, screaming, like, what is this? This is sick. Like, who's this guy? And uh, he comes, gives me this crazy hat. Somebody that you've never, like somebody you meet in the street and gives you this crazy hat. And, uh, and I was like this. And uh, he's like, hey, you have an accent. Where are you from? I'm like, I'm from Spain. So he starts talking to us and uh, he gives us his business card. I'll show it to you. I, I had it over the right way. Oh, he gives us his business card. Look at this. And, uh, and it was, it was, yeah. So Alan Lazowski from yeah. Last Parking, LAZ Parking. And I didn't know what this parking company was. And it looks like a, 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 it is a parking ticket. It is a it's an actual legit parking ticket. Yes. Yeah. With his name and like, his telephone number. Yeah. Very cool. That's yeah. Good marketing. Yeah. So, so he gives me this. And, uh, and that night I Googled him and I realized that uh, he's the owner of the largest parking company in the United States with 15,000 employees and 2 billion in revenue. Wow. So that guy starts calling us every couple of days, 
10, 11 p.m., Alan Colley. We spent like- Let me ask you, what was it about that event and him walking in, like, what was it that he saw that had him come back? I have no idea, okay. literally, I have no idea. And I was shocked, like, you know, when he was calling me, my, my wife or well, girlfriend at the time is like, why is this guy calling you? I'm like, I don't know. You know, like you have a guy that, that has 15,000 employees that his company is doing 2 billion in, in, in revenue. And it's calling me, somebody that has no money, that is about to fly back to Spain, you know, like, I, I don't know. But so he st we started talking business and more than business, it was like another way to do business. You know, I, I told you, I was pushing my employees, I was pushing my vendors, I was pushing everybody. And he was telling me that there's another way to do business. You know, when, when, when you help people from your heart, like conditionally, everything comes 10 times back. And it's all about the people. It's about, t you know, doing good for it, creating value for your clients, for your vendors, for your employees. And he starts putting all these ideas in my head. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that looks nice, but I don't think it's possible to do it in business. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but he was approved, he was doing this. So, you know, we started, he, he keeps calling and calling and calling. So that was, we met him in December. So let's say like in, back in September of 2014, you know, at that point we were like done. Like I didn't have a dollar, John had pawned his watch. We were doing these deals with my friend Gerard, but that 50% was not enough. You know, Miami is expensive to pay for my, my thing. So I was, uh, I was thinking about going back to Spain. I'm like, hey, and I even told John a couple of times, I think I'm going to have to go back to Spain or well, I need to find a job here. But by my visa situation, it was like not perfect. So, um, so, so John, one night he comes and it's like, he sends me a picture of a bill of sale sign for an $800,000 car. And we were buying like 50 to $100,000 car. And I'm like, what is this, John? Like, and he's like, no, like we're gonna buy this car for eight hundred thousand, and we're gonna sell it for one point one million dollars. I'm like, John, brother, like the contract says that we need to put a fifty thousand dollar non refundable deposit, and we don't have a dollar. Like, like you just pawned your watch. I have one hundred fifty dollars in my bank account. I need to call my dad to go back to Spain. Like, he's like, no, bro, you can raise the money. I'm like, John, I don't even know what this car is. It was a Lamborghini Miura. Had never seen a Lamborghini Miura. So, so imagine that. And this is how everything happens in life. No, and, and we're gonna talk about mid, more this more spiritual part later in the conversation, I guess. But uh, you know, like that day, okay. And and I had to do a presentation like a couple of months ago, so I was looking at all the the pictures. So that was September second, two thousand fourteen. So that day, that same day that John signs a contract, that same day that I'm about to call my dad to go back to Spain because I, I don't I don't know how to pay my next my, my next rent. Uh, so Alan called six, I was in the office by myself. Like I was crying. I remember, you know, thinking about my immigration status, like the job, this, that, it was a disaster. So, and Alan called 6 PM. Hey guys, I'm in Miami. There, uh, Alan was the president of the uh, American Party of Association. Like we had a, a Congress here at the Fontainebleau Hotel. We just finished. Do you guys want to go for dinner? So I'm like, okay. So I called John. Yeah, Alan is in Miami. Let's meet him at Mandolin. So we meet with Alan. And he starts asking us about the current agency. We tell him that it was a disaster. There was a company from California wanted to buy us out, to buy us, and they decided not to move forward with the deal. So we were gonna shut down the business. And, uh, and he's like, "What about the the old the old cars that you buy and sell?" And John is like, "We're gonna kill it. We're gonna be rich." <laughs> like that. John lives in another reality. You know, like he kills a in this world. He lives in another mm -hmm. world. So he's like, well, we're going to be rich. We're going to buy a car for $800,000. we are going to sell it for 1.1. I'm like, Alan, don't even listen to him. We need $50,000 to put the deposit and we have a dollar. So it's not going to happen. So Alan looked at us like, you guys are crazy. And I told Alan, yes, John is crazy. No, it's like, no, you're as crazy as John because you follow him. I'm like, <laughs> so, so Alan, he does this. He grabs his check. He starts writing something. And I didn't know what he was writing. And he looks at us and he's like, guys, I believe in you. He gives me, you're the money guy, right? He tells me, he gives me a check and he's like, here. And I look at it, $50,000. Like tomorrow you're gonna go to the bank, you're gonna put a $50,000 deposit, you're gonna go raise the 750 in the next couple of weeks and Johnny's gonna sell it for 1.1. I'm like, Alan, no. I mean, I, I was giving the check back. I'm like, no, you're going to lose your money. This is a non-refundable $50,000 and I cannot raise 750,000 in a couple of weeks for a car that I don't even know what it is. It's impossible. And he looked at me, but like that, mm. I believe in you. Mm. You're going to put a deposit, mm. you're going to go to a bank, and then John is going to, you're going to raise the money and John is going to sell it for 1.1. You can imagine in the restaurant, John and I were crying, crying. And uh, I raised the money 
And then John sold that car for $1,240,000. That was September. In December 2015, wow. we were launching officially for our Basel a year after meeting Alan, Curated Investments, our current company. Now, I remember you telling me this story before. It is so captivating that I, I remember every detail of it. There's something that Al wrote on that check because you said, Al, you're going to lose this money and I won't be able to pay you back. Yes. So Alan told me, like, did you read the check? And uh, I told him, yes, 50000 is like, not really better. So when I look at the check in the memo, it said, pay it forward. Mm -hmm. So Alan told me, I don't want you guys to pay me back. I want you guys to pay it forward. When you have the opportunity to help someone, you do it. So I want you guys to help your clients, your employees, your vendors, and anybody you can. So, and that was the biggest lesson, you know, that Alan, that Alan gave us. Mm -hmm. And a month later, we were starting this company together with Alan, you know, and, and you know, everything changed. You know, we started, we started the company with a new way of thinking, right? Thanks to the check. You know, Alan had been mentoring us for a year, but that was the turning point. And then we were starting to curate it with a new mentality. We're brought up learning to run a company from a place of fear and intimidation and um, almost like an iron fist, you know, scaring people into listening to you, operating from a place of fear rather than a place of love and compassion and embodying true leadership. And it seems that that is the mindset of Al that was then passed on to you yeah. and John. And that is sort of the essence or the, the soul of Curated yes. and how you then built your company. Yes. So I'll tell you something really quick about Alan. So I was always shocked, you know, like how, how this guy built a $2 billion company. Like in Spain, I never met somebody that had $2 billion <laughs> company. So, so I, I remember asking, I asked him so many times the same question, like, Alan, how did you build this? Because I, I wanted to get a different answer every time. And I, I always got the same answer. And Alan always says, like, Alan was a ballet parker. Mm. He started wow. parking cars. His dad and mom and Holocaust survivors came to the United States okay. with nothing. Mm -hmm. So Alan didn't even finish his studies. Mm -hmm. He left his, his, like, during a summer, he started parking cars. And then he's like, I'm not going back to university. I'm starting my own company. And he started parking cars. Was a ballet parker. So he went from parking cars to owning the largest parking company in the United States. And I asked him, like, how did you do that? And he always says the same thing. When you help people from your heart mm -hmm. unconditionally without expecting anything to change, yes. everything comes then to us. Yes. So just forget about money, mm -hmm. focus on helping people, and money is going to come later. Yeah. And, and I just want to, you know, dive into this a little bit deeper because, you know, one of the things I tried to help entrepreneurs understand is many of us entrepreneurs and including yourself and John at that time, were operating from a place of fear, scarcity, lack, stress. Yes. We're in fight or flight. So we are in those lower vibrations and wealth, health, love, abundance are all in the higher frequencies. But if we're down here and what we want is up here, you know, it's that big disconnect. And that's why you and John were grinding and hustling and doing all your things, flipping, flipping, but you're still stuck in those lower vibrational emotions. And what Alan demonstrated was when you are tuned into the frequency of gratitude and abundance and sounds like he's a man filled with joy and laughter, you are resonating at the frequency of millions and billions. And for all entrepreneurs listening out there or watching this, if you want to make millions, you have to ask yourself, am I embodying the frequency of millions? Am I having fun? Am I laughing? Am I contributing? Am I doing the things that bring me joy? Because when we're stuck in fight or flight in that scarcity mindset, we're not having fun. Yeah. You know, we wake up every day and we're so stressed that we are actually pushing abundance away, right? And what Alan so powerfully demonstrated is here's a check for 50K. I don't want it back. I believe in you. And from there, you were able to embody this, not just mindset, but this energy of paying it forward, of gratitude, of abundance. Because 
when you pay it forward and you write a check like that, you're telling God, telling the universe, hey, I'm abundant and I know there's billions out there for me. So I'm going to give this guy a check for 50K to help him get started because I know that I have access to as much money as I possibly want. And that's where people get stuck. Well, if I give this 50K, that's 50K less for me. What if you give that 50K and 250 shows up? Yeah. Because what happened when you guys created this company together off of that 50K, I think it worked out pretty good for Alan, would you say? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. It's like the yeah. values of the company today, imagine. What is the value that? I mean, because you guys, are, I think the number you dropped was like, you did like 23 million or something? No, 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 no. Way, way more than that. Okay. <laughs> so, so the first years of the company, cause yeah. we... It was difficult, you know, like we, so banks didn't want to work with us. So we started raising money. Tara was one of the investors, mm -hmm. my, my best friend. But then we, we, we had to bring on more people. So we ended up raising like $6 million. Okay. And with that $6 million, we were making deals. But now it was a 50-50 split. But from our 50%, pay rent, insurance, employees. So we were not making money at the end of the year. But three years later... You know, uh, I went with those financials to a bank and I told the bank, listen, like I'm giving 50% of everything that I make. If you give me a credit facility at 5%, okay, I would have paid $90,000 in interest instead of 590,000. So, you know, the banker did this, like, I'll give you an opportunity. So they gave me 3 million. Mm -hmm. So I sent 3 million back to the investors. Then six months later, the banker saw how quick we were moving the money. It's like, you know what, I'll give you another three. So they gave me 6 million send all the money back to the investors. Now we were in business. Mm -hmm. Company made the first million dollars in EBITDA, you know, that year. So in that moment, okay, uh, I was in Bali at my brother's wedding and John calls me, he's like, hey, this this guy from California that just walked in the showroom, you know, and he wants to meet with you as soon as we come, uh, as you come back. So I come back and uh, we meet with this guy, Jim. So we meet with him, and what I was telling you before, you know, I was with my sport jacket, John was with ripped jeans, a hat, and uh, Jim looked at us like, guys, do you, can you work together? Do you respect each other? And we told him like, yeah, like, you know, like that's, that's what we're talking, the one on one plus four, you know, this is, this is what it is, uh, our partnership. He was in love, like, I want to invest in you guys. So we told him like, hey, it's the first time that we made money, we're going to be able to pay Alan loan some money uh, to the business. We're going to be able to pay Alan back and we don't have any debt. So we don't, we don't need more partners. He's like, look me up. I think that you guys can dream bigger and I can help with you. I can help you with that. So we looked him up and he was Jim Getz, the former CEO of Sequoia Capital. Mm -hmm. He moved from California to Miami. He bought a house here in, uh, in Miami. And uh, he, this guy had been at the time, like for seven years, the number one tech investor in the world. In the, more, in the Forbes Midas list. So we called Alan, it's like, hey, Alan, like this builder wants to invest, you know, like what do we do? And Alan was like, hey, like this venture capitalist, you know, sometimes they look at the short term, we're not looking to sell anytime soon. So I'm really sure we have something special between the three of us. So, but we push him a little bit, it's like, yeah, Alan, like, why, why don't we explore it? So Jim picked Alan up with his uh, private jet at the, uh, in New York, they flew down to Miami, we had dinner, the four of us. And we realized how nice of a person Jim was. You know, Jim has done everything in life. You know, he was the lead investor for WhatsApp. He sold to to Facebook for 19 or 20 billion. I don't remember. So, and and now now what he wants to do in life, he just wants to help entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. He wants to help people. Mm -hmm. So it's the same mentality that Alan has, exactly the same one. So that night we signed a deal that and Jim became 25 percent wow. partner and curated. Wow. So now we are four partners, 25 percent each. So when Jim came in, he's like, guys, you have $6 million credit facility. You have to go for 15. And we're like, 15? Like, that's, we don't need that much money. He's like, ask for 15. Bank is going to give you 12, probably. So we go to the banks. And of course, having Alan and Jim behind John and me, they gave us $50 million. So what happened is that we had $6 million. We couldn't buy cars above a million dollars. It was a limitation from that credit facility. And now we had $15 million. We could buy anything we wanted. Mm -hmm. So the company goes from like doing like $18 million in revenue to $60 million 60. in one year. 60 million. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, I had the 15, but in a, in a year, we had our credit facility full. Mm -hmm. So I go to the bank, I'm like, guys, I need more money. I need 25. Alan and Jim are behind. So obviously the bank gives us money, boom, 25 million. We go from 60 to 75. And this past year, we did $113 million. And now I'm negotiating with the bank another credit facility for $35 million 
so we can keep growing the company. Oh. But it's been insane. Like the growth that we had in the last four years, it's been crazy. But the, the thing is like, we went through so much, yeah. you know, it was so difficult. But when we started the company, we started with the right mentality, the right values. So we started attracting the right people. And most importantly, the right energy. The right energy, the right exactly. Vibration. Right? Vibration in the, in the company. Like yeah, last year, I asked everybody, define curated in one word. 80% of the employees, they said family. You know, so we take care of everybody. Yes. So we all struggled together. The whole team struggled together. But when we started, when we had money and we were ready to go, you know, in 2021, is when the company exploded. Everybody started making money. Not only John, Alan, and me, you know, we started giving like crazy bonus, raising, sal raising salaries. Everybody was making below market. We didn't have money to pay more. But now, you know, everybody's making a lot of money. So everybody's happy and it's about sharing and helping people grow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and how many staff do you have now? 24 people. 24 people. And how big is your showroom? So we have 35,000 square feet. Wow. That showroom, restoration facility, right. storage facility. Okay. And how did you guys become the largest Lamborghini, vintage Lamborghini dealership uh, in the world? So that's all on John. Okay. You know, like uh, John said, he used to be a, a Lamborghini mechanic. Okay. Uh, he's one of the most talented mechanics that, uh, that are still alive today. Okay. And John grew up around all these cars. So John can tell you, like, if there is a Lamborghini Countach over there, he's going to tell you, oh, that bolt is wrong, that wing is wrong, this thing is wrong. You know, he has so much knowledge. Okay. So what we did, and this is like John's strength and talent, you know, like he's an amazing marketing person. He's a visionary. He has a vision, you know, and, and he was always obsessed with product, okay, and customer service. Mm -hmm. And those were the biggest fights that John and I, and I had, okay? Because like, he was telling me, oh, we're gonna buy this car for 100,000, we're gonna sell it for 120. And I'm the finance guy, oh, fantastic, 20% gross margin. But then the guy starts like, oh, we need to fix this. Oh, that was wrong, this is wrong. So boom, 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 we start like, we spend 20K. I'm like, John, we're not making any money. And sometimes we were even losing money. I'm like, John, we're losing like two, three thousand dollars So this was, and, Bro, trust me, trust me. He, he was always trusting me, like, no, trust me, no, we need to make money, you know? So over the time, okay, he was right, 100% right, because that client left happy. Mm -hmm. And that client became our fan. He bought like 20, 30 cars and he brought his wow. friends. Okay. You know, so and that happened yeah. not with one client, with many clients. Right. So this is how, you know, yeah. one of the- I was thinking long game. Exactly. I was thinking, yeah, the and, big picture. And, and, the, and the quality, you know, because like, for him, these cars are not cars. It's like, it's, it's a treasure. It's more than a car. Right. So he needs to make sure that they're perfect. Yes. So it, 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 that's his obsession with perfection. Yeah. So that's, and then on the other side, okay, Johnny's like, he's an amazing speaker. If you go to our YouTube channel, you will see like, mm -hmm. it's just like a, today he's a celebrity. We'll go to car shows. Like he cannot walk 10 feet without 30 people taking selfies with him. Very cool. You know, and, and he has so much knowledge. So we started this YouTube channel. We started like putting this out, you know, like, People saw that he's an honest guy. You know, in the car world, there's like, there's not a lot of honest people. I'm mm -hmm. you know, right. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So they saw this guy that has a lot of knowledge. He's a good guy. He, you know, he's humble. Mm -hmm. He, so they're like, people fall in love with him and they just want to buy cars from mm -hmm. him. So that's what happened, you know, and over time, so we started working so much on Lamborghinis that we became the number one client of vintage Lamborghini parts in mm -hmm. the world. Perfect. So Lamborghini called us. You know, we went to Lamborghini, we met with the president, we met with everybody, and Lamborghini has a, a, a thing called Polo Storico that is a certification for vintage Lamborghinis. So the brand new Lamborghini dealerships, normally they didn't want to work on these cars. You know, it can take like, the car can be in a leaf for like two months before okay. you find out what's wrong, you find the part, if the part doesn't exist, you have to build a part. So they didn't want to work on these cars. So we're experts in this, Lamborghini calls us and it's like, hey guys, why do you want, so if you want a Lamborghini uh, Polo Storico certification, you have to send the car to Italy. And they ask like, do you want to become a Lamborghini Polo Storico um, facility in the United States? So last year we signed this deal. So today we're helping Lamborghini certify vintage Lamborghinis. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's quite the honor. Yeah. Right? It is. Yeah. It is. And crazy to from where you were from buying that first Lamborghini, not even knowing what it was to now becoming an official Lamborghini um, partner, yeah. partner, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, you know, I love your story for so many reasons, and it, it really is that the 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 prime example of what happens when you have passion and you have faith and you are willing to just take chances, yes. right? And the other thing about your story I love is you know the diversity of your partnership and how you've been able 
to learn from each partner skills and qualities that have allowed you to grow as an individual that have also supported your personal development journey. Because I remember when you reached out to me because I was following your dealership. You started following me. You started to learn about my journey and my path of becoming an entrepreneur and, and what you've learned from Al, from John, um, from your partner from Sequoia, John as well. Jim. Jim, right. So Jim, John, and, um, and Alan. Each one of them has taught you things that have now played a part in who you've become. You know, so when you reflect on the different lessons and um, teachings that, let's say, Alan has passed on to you or John or Jim, what would you say some of the most powerful um, lessons or uh, perspectives they've shared with you that has helped you to become the, the man, the entrepreneur, the husband, the father that you are today? And you know, like there's there's something that Alan always says that he, he always says it's all about the people, mm. you know, and you're you're as good as the people that you are working with. Right. So it's all about the people, you know. It's about uh, yeah, taking care of everybody, and it's having this paid for mentality. It's like when you have the opportunity to help someone, you do it, and uh, and once you focus your energy, you know, on doing this, on helping people, or making sure that the client is going to receive the best car possible. Yeah. You know, and the client is going to be happy. Like our purpose in Curated is not making money. We have a higher purpose that uh, it's, it's, it says like Curated where dreams drive and passion and history are preserved for generations. Yeah. So that's what we're gonna do. Like you had a poster of the Lamborghini Countach, we wanna fulfill that dream You're that right. you had when you were a kid. Right. So we're fulfilling dreams and then we wanna preserve, mm -hmm. okay, this passion and this knowledge. We wouldn't want this to get lost for future generations. So that's why we're doing all this documentation. We call ourselves historians. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do, you know, like, and, when you do that and you forget about the money part, yeah, we have our KPIs and we need to meet them. And But when you forget about that for a second and you focus on fulfilling people's dreams, you know, and then while you do this, you need to make sure that your employees are happy. And they, they you know, like that's something that I do a lot, okay? I coach my employees. I need to make sure that they are happy. Mm -hmm. I, in their personal, in their professional life, I have an obsession. My obsession is to see growth, whether it's business growth of personal growth in people. And I love that. I feel, it feels so good. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I, I remember that when, I, when I met Alan at the beginning, I don't remember what it was, but he made me a big favor. Called him like 10 times, 10 different days to thank him. Mm -hmm. he, he, every day he was giving me the same answer. Like, Jordi, please stop thanking me. I'm the one that should be thanking you for giving, the giving me the opportunity mm -hmm. to help you. Yeah. And you don't realize how good it, it feels. So at that time, I was somebody that when I was helping somebody, I was expecting something in exchange. Right. And that person was never meeting my expectations. Mm. Oh, I did this for, you know, and my wife used to like, like I remember some conversation with my wife. Oh, like this friend, I did all of this for him. And look at, you know, I, I was always frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Alan starts talking about this. And today I, I realize about Alan's words. Because today I, I'm not doing anything, expecting anything to change. You know, I'm doing something because I want to help you because I want to give. Yes. And that's it. And yeah. I forget about this. And, but, it's gonna come back, but I, I'm not even expecting yeah. for this to come back. Yeah, and, and the beauty of when we are able to give is we are able to experience the gratitude and the joy of seeing someone fulfill their dreams yes. because of what you're able to provide them with. Like when Alan wrote you that check for 50K, it gave him more joy to give it to you than it was for you to receive it because he knew that that 50K, he's in a position to do that because of the abundance he's created in his life. So he's grateful that he can hand that over to you and he's, He's shifting the energy to you, the yes. gratitude from all of his years of hard work. And I think this is, you know, a, a, a big paradigm shift. Many people, especially entrepreneurs, can choose to have that will make a big difference for them is choosing to believe that we are abundant and that when we give and we give with love and we give with no expectation, the universe will give us back tenfold, but we have to first take that step and choose yeah. that. And there's a book, I'm trying to remember the name right now, but it's all about being a giver. And um, it's escaping me now, but I'll try to remember it and put it in the show notes. But the whole book is about being able to give back and, and just share. And I know many you know religions talk about giving 10% back yeah. of your earnings because again, it's just yeah. Contributing to others, but then also just showing God, like, look, I believe, I trust, and I'm going to give away knowing that there's more coming. 
And a lot of times it's not even about giving money, you know, and, and I wish, I wish Jordi, my, myself, I could talk to myself 10 years ago, yeah. you know, <laughs> it was like a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, this guy has money. Like Alan, no, he has got money. It's easy for him to do. Yeah. No, you know, like when it was, so a, a month ago, I was, uh, Alan, they put together this uh, annual reunion, okay, in last parking. So they had 300 managers of the like 15,000 employees. I was having lunch in a big table and there's this woman, they, they call her like tea money. Mm. So he was the first person that worked in finance with Alan. And she was telling me that at 20 something years ago, almost 30 years ago, they, they were a small company. They didn't have a lot of money. And there, was peop there were people coming to Alan's office every day looking for checks. And this woman went to Alan. It's like, Alan, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop giving checks to people. People are taking advantage of you. And it looks like Alan looked at this woman and told her like, Tina, I will never, ever, ever stop helping people and giving money to people. I don't care if I go broke. Wow. So whether you want to accept it or not, you know, this is who I am. Mm. So Alan at that time, he didn't have money. You know, he, he was not a wealthy person. He was doing this, you know, and, I did, and, and, and apart from that, what Alan gave me, it was not even money, you know, like he gave me his time. Yes. He spent hours and hours on the phone and meetings and these and that because like he never invested a lot of money. We raised the money from, he helped me. He taught me how to raise money from yeah. individuals. Yeah. He taught me how to go to banks and, and, get, and get a credit facility. Mm -hmm. But he never gave, gave me a lot of money. He just, yeah. something to start. And that's a beautiful message for people to hear because we don't have to be wealthy and have millions in the bank to give back. No. It could just be if you're an entrepreneur and you've been in the game 20 years and some young man in his early 20s wants to take you for coffee because he needs a little bit of advice or she needs some guidance, that 15 minutes can be the yes the, the turning point, the catalyst for that person yes. to feel confident enough to take that step, right? 100%. Yeah, and yeah so I, I want to... I want to end this with you just telling me a little bit about this because this is amazing. This is uh, the first, this advanced reader copy draft <laughs> of Pay It Forward, uh, a collection of wisdom and um, anecdotes and things that you have received from your mentor. Um, yeah, I'd love to just uh, hear a little bit about it. That period of like seven, eight years, the first seven years of Alan, you know, like every time that I was spoken with him over the phone, like he was giving me like a, a lesson that it was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. It was not shocking, it was common sense, not in the business world, mm -hmm. but in the business world, I'm like, you cannot do this. Like, it's not gonna work. People right. are gonna take advantage of you. Like, you know, all these things. So, but I, I started writing it down in my notes, in my phone. And after the seven years, I had so much content that I'm like, one day I was flying to Bali to visit my brother. I'm like, let me put this in a word file. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to a word file. And I spent those like, I don't know, 20 something hours of the trip, just like typing and cleaning it. Right. So for the next like year, I kept like improving it. So last year it was Alan's birthday. We were in Germany. Uh, he came with us for a business opportunity we had in Germany and it was his birthday. I'm like, you know what? It would be nice to print those papers and mm. give it to him as a gift. But it was not gonna be a book. It was just like, I don't know, a gift and maybe something I can share with my employees so we can make more strong our culture mm. within Curated. So I gave it to him. It was beautiful, no? he was crying, it was amazing. So, it, so last year, I went to the Conscious Capitalism uh, event, okay, this is an organization that it's all about, you know, like doing good in business. It was founded by John Mackey, the founder of uh, Whole Foods. So I was there, Alan is one of the board members, and his business partner asked me how he met Alan. So I told him the, the paid forward story, and a couple of weeks later, he calls me and he's like, Jordi, like in last parking, every year we have an annual reunion and we're looking for a theme. Mm. Last year was creating opportunities for people. The year before was never, ever give up. So we're looking for a theme and you inspire me. And I told your story to the whole management team and we decided that page four is going to be the theme for last parking 2024. I was shocked. But then he's, he tells me like, I would love for you to come to our convention to tell your story and I want you to bring your book. Mm. I'm like, what book? You know, I always, like, have some papers that I gave it right. to Alan with like some lessons that I learned from him. So, you know, Michael, this guy, he forced me to actually like put it in a book format. So I did this draft, you know, and then I went to the band and I went to look for stories, last stories. So this is half book. Now I'm working on like, you know, like creating all these, uh, putting all these stories within the book and hopefully like in the next six months it's gonna be ready. But basically it's 12 lessons that I learned from Alan 
that uh, it should be common sense, you know, but it's not, unfortunately, in the business world. Right. So it's all about paying it forward and elevating humanity through business and unconditional love. You know, it's a bit of, for me, pay it forward is unconditional love. And when you bring unconditional love within business, like crazy things happen. Like look at my story, you know, yeah, like from being broke, yeah. you know, I have a, a, a companies that are doing more than a hundred million dollars in time. Yeah. Amazing. Such an inspiring story, and I look forward to digging into this book because uh, even though I haven't met Alan yet, uh, I have a great deal of respect for him for you know how he supported you and John. Is just and who he is, what he stands for, because obviously you you're an embodiment of his uh, of his mentorship, right? So, um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for um, being so generous and open with all the things you've been through. And yeah, I just want to. Uh, I tell you, I appreciate you and the mission that you're on, and uh, I look forward to coming to see Curated sometime very soon because uh, I just got to uh, experience the the incredible business that you've created, and would love to meet John as well. And you know, for anybody who wants to learn more about Curated, you can check out the uh, link down below. You know, if you're uh, in the market for a vintage Lamborghini or one of the many other cars, you know, hit up uh, Jordy or John. And yeah, brother, just want to thank you for your time and for, you know, reaching out and sharing your journey. And uh, I know this is just the beginning for you. And there's once this book gets published, I'm sure no <laughs> doubt it'll become a New York Times bestseller. And yeah, I'm proud of you, brother. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I still need to work a little bit. You're going to help me maybe like on, on putting myself out. You know, I'm yeah. still shy. Well, you did great for your first <laughs> podcast. You know, you did amazing. And, you know, thank you for being here and sharing your journey. Thank you so much. All right, brother. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast and you learned something valuable, then please hit subscribe so you don't miss the future episodes. I'd love it if you share this with a friend and leave us a review. Your feedback is so important to our growth. Thank you for supporting the Path to Purpose podcast. I appreciate you. I'll see you in the next episode.